Hello and welcome to another episode of So Fly. It is the beginning of October. We're back in the studio. Uh, my name is Mitch. We've got Gab here. Hey, everyone. Got Aldo. Hey. We've got Yilma. Hey, everyone. We got the full team here today because uh, we're, like I said, we're in the studio beginning of October and we're interviewing a very special guest today. Somebody we're very excited to have on the show. Um, we've been looking forward to this one for a while. He is truly a fly fishing legend, an incredible author. Uh, we're all fans of his work and we're so excited to be talking to John Gearak. John, how's it going? It's going well. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks a bunch, John. Yeah, that, <laughs> means, awesome. that means a lot. You're welcome. <laughs> Just a bunch of Canadian uh, boys, you know, and then you're like, oh, yeah, I'll come on the, on the show. So that means a lot. It's cool. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, we were just uh, we were just talking uh, before we got on the uh, recording here to John, who was fishing today. And, and how'd it go today, John? I was fishing. Uh, you know, it was difficult, but I, I managed to get a few, which is, you know, kind of not a bad way to, to fish. Um the water, we've had a drought here, so the water's real low, but it's, I was fishing at tailwater, and so it's cold, it was plenty cold, but boy, it's low and skinny and just crystal clear, and I went up because I thought it was going to be cloudy today, and it was sunny, so, you know, a, a 6X tippet on the surface looks like a cable, <laughs> <laughs> so I Spooked more fish than I was able to catch, uh, cast to, but, you know, I just, I, I went to, I just went around to the heads of pools, basically, where the water was moving, and that would cover my cast a little bit, and there were a few blue-winged olives coming off. I thought they'd be pouring off, but there was one or two now and then, just enough that the fish were looking for them. So I got, I think I got five. Right in like I don't know two hours, which isn't bad. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've been battling. One some, of them. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say one of them was a pretty nice rainbow. Oh yeah, about fifteen inches, real fat, real pretty. Nice kind of fish where you stop for a minute, you know, and just look around and go, "Geez, it's a nice day." And what could be better, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Has fall arrived yet? In uh, you're in Colorado, eh? I am in Colorado. I'm in northern Colorado. I'm in the last county before Wyoming, if that tells you anything. Mm. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's coming, but um, we had a hot, dry summer, and I'm ready for cold. I'm ready to be building a fire in the wood stove yeah. here in my office. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it was like um, up on the river, I think it was in the mid-60s. I'm a thousand feet lower, so it probably when I got home it was probably seventy here. Yeah. So and you know that's I mean that's it's better than ninety five for sure. But I'm I'm just ready. I'm ready for winter. I'm so mm-hmm. ready for the cold too. We we're up. So we're up. Like I said, we're up in uh, Toronto in um, Ontario, and mm-hmm. it's been a hot summer. We've been. Uh, We've been sweating all summer, fishing for pike and things like that in warm water, and I, I, I think we're looking around all like pretty oh, stoked yeah. for fall. Yeah, very, we, very excited for fall. <clears throat> we got a pretty chilly day today with some rain finally. And it's we've exciting. Been, we've been battling some low water, much like you, low, clear, clear, clear water. Um, so yeah. we're just we're happy it's starting to rain for sure. So, so John, I want to get into a bunch of questions we have for you today. Um, but it's again, sure. just like it's rather broad because we want to talk about you as a, as an angler and get a sense of like sort of your background and, and your fishing history. Um, so, firstly, can we just talk about how you got into fly fishing to begin with? Uh, sure. I was. Um, I had always been a fisherman. I mean, I don't remember when I started fishing. I have these sort of vague childhood memories of being plopped on the end of a dock with an overturned bucket and told to watch a bobber and, <laughs> um, and you know, going out in the in the boat with the grown-ups and being told to keep quiet because it would scare the fish if I talked and all that crap they <laughs> feed you when you're a kid. Um, so I had fished, I'd grown up fishing conventionally, um, cane pole and worms and later... Uh, level line bait casting rig and plugs and stuff like that. I somehow, I somehow bypass spin fishing. Oh, really? Probably because, of, probably because of my family, they were all, they were all bait chuckers. But, um, 
Uh, and then when I came out, well, when I went off to college, I kind of gave it up. I was in the Midwest, in Ohio. There wasn't much. There were some muddy beaver or uh, uh, farm ponds, and there was a thing called the Blanchard River that flowed through the town where my college was, but it was muddy, and there were breweries, and it was polluted, and so it just wasn't any fishing, and you know, when I was in college in the 60s and thought I was a an intellectual and a revolutionary and just kind of lost track of it. And then when I came out west after college, I came out to Colorado. And, um, geez, I brought my fishing stuff, but I just saw people fly fishing. Yeah. Hmm. And I thought, geez, that's just about the prettiest thing I've ever seen. So, I mean, it was... It was this total, and I don't think I'd ever seen a trout in the flesh before. Oh, really? I mean, I knew they existed. I'd seen pictures of them. Um, we were bass and pike guys, basically. So it was just, I, I, as soon as I saw it, I wanted to do it. Um, once I did it, I was hooked, and that's just kind of, I just became fascinated with with the method, with fly casting and, and fishing flies and all that stuff. So it just, I, I don't think I went back yeah. uh, ever. I mean, once or twice, you know, I, you know, if I really wanted a, a trout for dinner, I might put a worm on a hook and catch one on my fly, fly rod. But basically I just became a fly fisherman. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's sort of like a common thread. I think people, they get into fly fishing and that's it. They don't really look back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not like I suddenly decided that all of the kinds of fishing were the devil's work or anything. I just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I just prefer it. I mean, it's I, I think it's beautiful and it's challenging and everything about it is pretty and... You know, like today, I mean, what are you going to do with a with a six inch rapala on a day like today, where the water's, uh, you know, eight inches deep and clear, yeah. and the sun's out? You know, you fish a size twenty blue wing olive on a six x tippet, and I just it it still amazes me that you can catch a fish that way. Yeah, it is crazy, really. Uh, yeah, and it also amazes me the size of the fish you can catch on like a size like uh, well at least in Colorado <laughs> and Wyoming I was out there a year ago and and just the fish you get on a, tw a size 20 zebra midge or blueing olive is insane <laughs> it's insane well it, yeah i mean you can you can hook and land a big fish but you know to be honest mostly we hook and land little fish i mean yeah a lot of the a lot of my home water uh, you know, I was telling you, I caught that one, like, 14 or 15-inch rainbow. I mean, that's a hell of a fish where I fish. Um, there are places where I can go and probably locate and maybe catch a 20-incher, but, you know, that's a nice fish. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it really is. Do you remember what your first fish on the fly rod was? Was it a trout? I don't. I don't. And I, it's funny, I was just working on a story, and I was trying to remember... And I just, it's been, um, it's been a while, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was, would have been in the late 1960s. And, I mean, I think, I think it was around home, on my home <laughs> drainage somewhere. And it was probably on at Adams because I think that's all I knew how to fish at the time. Uh, yeah. But um, I, I, I really don't. I wish I did. Yeah, it can be. T I mean, after so many fish, I'm sure it's you know it's tough to it can be tough to remember. Well, and I think it was one of those things where, at the time, I probably thought I'll never forget this. Yeah, and then and then promptly forgot. It, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not 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 long yeah. after. Yeah, for sure. So how did you how did you find yourself getting into fly fishing writing then? Because at this late '60s, you get into fly fishing. How did that progression sort of uh, sort of go? Well, by the time I'd gotten out of college, I studied, um, I had a, a major in philosophy. I had a dual minor in uh, art and English. And I was just, it, you know, I had a bachelor's degree, but I was just unqualified for any kind of work that didn't involve a broom or a shovel. <laughs> yeah, <right>? yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. 
so uh that there used to be a joke about that around here but um <laughs> i i think i had decided by then that i just wanted to be a writer yeah and had been had been writing this and that up till then and i started reading I think it was Fly Fisherman magazine. I think that was the only, the only magazine dedicated in, in, exclusively to fly fishing. Mm-hmm. And I just remember thinking, um, these are nice enough stories, but you know, this is not Ernest Hemingway. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is something a guy could do. Yeah. And they and they pay. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that was it. I'd been a struggling writer for a couple of years, and I sold the first fly fishing story I tried to sell for like a month's rent. Oh, wow. Or like a month's, like a month's pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, that was pretty compelling. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and so, and I think I was just kind of lucky enough to be on the ground floor. I mean, in, in the late sixties, fly fishing was still kind of the sporting backwater that everybody's grandpa used to fly fish, but nobody fly fished, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there were a few people, there were some people back in New York, up in the, in, up in the Catskills and stuff that still fly fished, and but it was just starting to get popular again, and I was kind of into it and. At that point, I did sort of know how to write. Uh, looking back on it, I'm not sure I was right, but I, I thought I knew how to write. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and it was just, you know, the, the, the I sort of grew along with the market. You know, some other magazines came out. Mm-hmm. Um, the first magazine that was uh, dealt with Western fly fishing was called Fly Fishing the West. Uh, editor was a guy named Don Roberts yeah. and um, God, I was, I, there were a couple of years when I was just, everybody thought I was on the staff. I was in every issue and uh, I don't know. I just, uh, occasionally I would write for the, for the bigger, you know, field and stream yeah. sports of field, outdoor life, those guys. Yeah. Uh, they were, they were a little more of a pain in, in the ass than, <laughs> and the fly fishing guys, but um, and then you know I I thought I'd write a book and I did and it did okay and did well enough. The publisher wanted another book and one thing led to another. That's super cool. That's really interesting to see. I mean, you have such like a breadth of work from over the years too that it's it's just so cool to see you know somebody be able to write about fly fishing for all these years. <clears throat> How have you seen well, it? it? You know, it was once easier because back then it was all print. Yeah. You know, we didn't, there was no internet. Uh, there was no email. Right, there was none true. of that. We worked on, worked on manual typewriter. An electric typewriter was like, that was futuristic. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and the magazines paid. Yeah. Right. Uh, unlike right. websites and mm-hmm. blogs and all this other stuff, which doesn't pay. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not even sure you could do that anymore. No, we're finding that we're out right finding now. That out yeah. Right <laughs> now. <laughs> John Gabier, I'm a I'm a photographer for SoFly, but also a freelance and I'm reaching out to magazine right now and it is it is pretty hard. <laughs> like you just said. Yeah, well there's plenty there's plenty of competition. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the markets are just so scattered now into all these websites and stuff. Um, you know, I've I've just got myself established and and i've got the books in print and all that so you know i can i can still do it but yeah. i'm just not sure how you know every once in a while a young writer will come up and say how do i get started and i'll say damned if i know <laughs> yeah, I, write, I can, write something yeah write something I, just do it yeah well i can tell you how to get started in the 1960s yeah <laughs> yeah but 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 not now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody knows that. We, we, yeah, we, we're all trying to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, uh, really John, cool. I also heard that um, for a short period of time you wanted to be a fly fishing photojournalist. How long did that last? Well, I actually didn't ever really want to be, but in the old days, 
you were expected to uh, supply photographs with your articles. Yeah. Right. Mm. And so, you know, I just got a camera and learned how to take photographs so I could sell the stories. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, it was actually, I, I, I didn't enjoy it. Well, I won't say I didn't enjoy it. You know, you, you guys know what it means when you take a good photograph. You say, now, boy, that's a nice photograph. Everything's right. The composition, the focus, everything's good. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there was some satisfaction to it. But honestly, when I got to the point where uh, I didn't have to do it anymore to sell stories, uh, I just quit. Yeah. I got a little a little digital camera that I can carry in my pocket for the in, inevitable hero shots when somebody catches a big fish, but right. I just don't do it anymore. Classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And it was it was purely accidental. I would you know I would work and slave to write these good stories, and I'd submit them to an editor, and he'd say, "Well, you got photos." <laughs> yeah, right. And I go, well, why don't you talk to a photographer? It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's funny that you say that. I, but, oh, sorry, sorry. I, yeah, well, I finally just one time I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, okay, we'll buy it anyway. Oh, right. On. And I thought, oh, man. Yeah. Great. Great. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's funny because the way you say, like, back in the days, you needed photo to sell your, your articles. Now yeah. you need an articles to sell your photo kind of thing because I... I get asked all the time, oh, do you have a text with that? And I'm like, well, I speak French. My writing is not very good. <laughs> so I'm I'm kind of shit out of luck. <laughs> yeah, you could probably you could probably find somebody you could partner up with. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course, then you're splitting the money, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so have you seen, so, you know, you're talking about starting in the, in the late 60s and, and even your writing career. How have you seen fly fishing change over the years, you know? Um, I'm sure you've seen so many different sort of transi- transitions in the sport, but how, is the, how have you seen it sort of progress? Well, God, um, the, the main thing was it got, it started to get more and more popular, and then, like, sort of overnight, it got fashionable. Yeah. <laughs> which is not quite the same as popular, and... So you would you suddenly started seeing TV ads for credit cards and painkillers that had people fly fishing because it was a cool thing to do, mm-hmm. and um, and in fact, early on they've they've kind of gotten over that now. But early on, they they get people who didn't know how to cast. Yeah. So if you actually did fly fish, you you just sit there and laugh at the guy through the whole commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, I've seen those commercials. Yeah, I've seen those commercials. Yeah. The, yeah. They get the rod wrong. The reel is different. <laughs> is that a Mastercard? Yeah. He's like reeling backwards. I think yeah. it was a Mastercard yeah. commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was exactly. They've got a Ford commercial out now, and the guy casts, and it was it's actually a good cast. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like shocked <laughs> yeah. that there was somebody. Who, Actually, knew how to cast. Yeah. It was awesome. yeah, I think I think they finally somebody finally said, you know, people are laughing at you. Yeah, <laughs> a so. very small small group of people are laughing at you. Yeah, it's very true. Um, well, what uh, about when it comes to so 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 it got popular and then fashionable yeah. and then suddenly there's a lot of a lot more people doing it and so the at least the easy to reach streams started to get uh, more crowded. And so the fishing got harder. Yeah. And then you started to see catch and release regulations come in on some places. And it's, yeah, it's really different in a lot of, well, for one thing, when I started, I don't think you could get like a fly casting lesson. You know, you were really? just expected to go buy a fly rod and go figure it out or mm-hmm. have somebody show you The none of the shops offered lessons or anything like that. And, uh, of course, now you can you can all but get a Ph.D. in fly fishing and you <laughs> take classes to tell you how to do everything. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so that was a big thing. And there were no, um, you know, we were the the 
bunch I was with, we were trying to learn how to cast through books because there were no videotapes, there were no Mm -hmm. YouTube videos, it was none of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at step-by-step black and white photos in a book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, some things never change. I mean, uh, I never use any YouTube videos or anything like that. I, I, I looked at the books, and I also, well, and then I also got someone to teach me. Um, but I think it's better that way. You can do, you can look at someone else doing it, but they also, they also have their own style. If you look at the actual f- figures, you know, do this, that, and the other, you'll develop your own style, but you also know exactly the fundamentals behind it. So I think that's actually a better yeah. way of doing it. Yeah, and, you know, there were plenty of times when I'd be out flog in the water and some older guy would come over and very politely say, excuse me, son, do you mind if I make a suggestion? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Love that. I wish that happened. And I, I know. And I'd say, yeah, please. And, you know, he'd say, well, you know, don't stop, you know, stop your wrist here. Don't bend your wrist. Stop it at one o'clock instead yeah. of way in the back. And, yeah. Um, and then he'd look at my fly and he'd think, Jesus, where did you get this? And, <laughs> Why you, you know, that? and you just, you'd just pick it up that like that. Yeah. Uh, what about the fishing? Is it as good as it used to be, you find, on the rivers that you frequent most? I don't think it is, honestly. Yeah. Um, the, the fish are just pounded more. There's more pressure. Um, although, you know, there's... there's there's still fish. I mean, the one the one good thing about fly fishing is the catch and release ethic. Most people release their fish. Yeah. Um, I don't. I actually, if it's legal, I don't have anything against keeping a few. I do yeah. from time to time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But um, most people release their fish, and of course, there's some unintended mortality. There's people who don't know how to handle a fish. Yeah. Well, and and I know I've done it. Every once in a while, you get one, and you just, you know, you you handle it badly. It's it's deeply hooked or whatever, and um, you know, you know, you didn't do it any good. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, there's there's still fish, and every once in a while, you know, like today, um, it's middle of the week. It's you know, everybody's back in school and back at work. Uh, things quiet down this time of year, and I had, God, I, I had five or six good long stretches of river all to myself. I don't know if somebody fished them that uh, this morning before I got there, but, you know, fish are up rising and um, bugs are hatching, and it seemed it was un, as undisturbed as you could want it, mm-hmm. and so... You know, I did okay. Like I said, the conditions were were difficult. So mm-hmm. I just I, I can still see a couple of times when I'd throw a, a long cast up to a riser, and between me and that riser, five fish would flush from my <laughs> cast. Oh yeah, I suppose I should have worked my way up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, John, I wanted to ask. Um, so, with all those years, what's your favorite hatch? The, you get the fish, like the one you're looking for the most. Um, I you know probably the the bluing olive hatch, because it comes off almost every place I fish. It's a real dependable hatch. Uh, we get it in the spring and we get it again in the fall. Um, technically, I guess it involves more than one insect, but. You know, small, eighteen to twenty-two um, bluish, olivish mayflies, and um, I don't know. It's it's the one I fish the most. It's the one I'm most confident of my fly patterns on. Um, I suppose that would be my favorite hatch. But um, do you have any? God, like- I love. I love green drakes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, last summer, I fished a black drake hatch up on the upper Columbia. That was amazing. Um, great big size, eight and ten. Jeez. Mayflies hatch in the, you know, hatch in the evening and, and on into the night. Oh. And, uh, God, just, 
you know, I mean, it's just every hatch is a is a different uh, a different challenge. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, enjoy them all. Yeah. Do you have any memories of like an exceptional hatch, like one that just stands out in your mind, uh, one you can't forget? I mean, those black drakes sound amazing. The black drakes are gonna are gonna be on that list for sure because we I just partly because it was really difficult fishing but doable if you know what I mean. I mean you didn't have to be an absolute expert to do it, but you really had to bear down. Um, but I can remember in fact a blue wing olive hatch on the South Platte River down in Cheeseman Canyon, which was Colorado's first ever catch and release area. I think it was I think they made a catch and release in nineteen seventy six. 75, 76, mm. and it was a gray, overcast October day and uh, perfect blueing olive weather. I was down there by myself, and there was there's a big pool that they call the Holy Water. It's a great, big, long, riffly pool full of fish, and the olives are pouring off of that, and I, I got in at the bottom, and I took hours fishing up it and I just caught more fish than I had any right to <laughs> and I got all the way up to the top and I stopped and leaned up against the rock and had a smoke and I turned around and they were still rising all the way back down the pool so oh, wow so I got out walked around got in and did it again caught as many fish again jeez and then it's probably the most. It's probably the most trout I ever caught in a day of fishing, <laughs> and it, and it was only about four four and a half hours. Wow, that's awesome. And it wasn't so much about the number of fish. I'm, I've never been one of those guys that just wants to tune a boat fish, but it was just they wouldn't stop. You know, they wouldn't <laughs> stop eating. Yeah. They were relentless. <laughs> They were they were relentless. I mean, they didn't care that I was there. I mean, I'd I'd spook them when I'd I'd hook one, but by the time I got him landed and unhooked, they'd yeah. be rising again. And... <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So speaking of rivers too, because um, obviously you're in a pretty amazing place in the world for some really amazing rivers, but you know, going going around uh, fishing around other places too over the years. Like, what 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 are some of your favorite rivers to fish? Whether it's your home rivers or abroad. Well, you know they've changed because um, uh, because the fishing has changed and things have gotten uh, things have gotten um, as yeah. I said more crowded, more difficult. Yeah, I was in uh, Utah on the Green River in March, and um, that's a that thing gets hammered through the season, but if you go real early in March, there's hardly anybody there, and uh, once again, blueing olives yeah. are starting to come off, and um, so you fish. You get a whole. We had, one day we had the entire flaming gorge all to ourselves. Oh wow! And you know we had, there were four of us in in two boats, but. Um, so you fish um, streamers in the morning and get some really nice fish. And then maybe about 1 o'clock, when it warms up just a little bit, uh, you'll find these just little pods of olives coming off out of riffles. And fish will be rising to them. And so you put away your big 8-weight streamer rod and get out your 5-weight dry fly rod and tie on an olive and catch, flies, uh, catch fish on on dry flies, and then you row down to the takeout and uh, go get something to eat in town. Right on. It's great. Yeah, that sounds like an awesome day of fishing. Um, I've always liked the frying pan. Yes, river. the frying pan. It's amazing. over. Yeah, you know the you know I've, the pan. <clears throat> yeah, I was lucky enough to fish it uh, two springs ago. That was fantastic, and the Roaring Fork. It's beautiful. I like the Roaring Fork. I like the I like the frying pan better. I'd say I'd like the frying pan better as well. I'm going to have to agree with you there. The toilet bowl run and everything was just awesome. It was unreal. The toilet bowl is, is 
aptly named, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's just this low, it's just slow water, just full of just just slabs of, of of rainbow trout, huge trout. I know some some of those fish are so fat they're they're, they're grotesque. <laughs> yeah, they they are. Uh, they're 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 yeah. They're, well, they what it is is they put micey shrimp in the reservoir above, and um, I think to feed the they've got lake trout up there. Oh wow! And I think it, I think it was to feed the the young lake trout because they were trying to get a self sustaining population. Yeah. And those things flush out the out the bottom of the dam into the toilet bowl, yeah. and those fish just sit there and eat. And they're just like swimming with their yeah, mouths open. Yeah, yeah, pretty much e- eating yeah. shrimps. That sounds yeah. pretty good. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, they exactly. And and there's they they get they gain weight so fast they can't grow long fast enough, so they just get these huge guts and high backs and. They're not especially pretty fish, but they sure are big. They sure are big, yeah. And we're catching some pretty um, pretty good browns that day too. Yeah, There's... we tend to fish downstream of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I mean, I, I've gone up there. It's hard to resist. <laughs> yeah, but, it is. Um, but you know, it just typical on a typical day is just lined with fishermen, and it's you know it's kind of combat fishing. Yeah, I was there yeah. with you snow, can... snow still on the ground, so I. There were guys, but I assume there's way more guys when the weather's a little lot nicer. Yeah. 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 Well, if you've never if you've never fished it, I mean, you have to go fish the toilet bowl. It's just something to see. Yeah. But we, you know, once you have fished it for about thirty five years, you <laughs> get to be more of a connoisseur, and you want to go downstream and fish the hatches and stuff. So. Yeah, that's it's it's all very very pretty water. Yeah, I spent three days on on the pan. I did eleven mile canyon as well in the South Platte and. Really fell in love with mm-hmm. Colorado. I was driving to Montana, but I think it was it was pretty hard to leave Colorado. To be honest, it was a very romantic place. Well, there's great fishing all over the it's Rocky ins- Mountains. It's insane. It's insane. Mm-hmm. And I ski as well, so that was pretty special. It's a good place. Oh yeah. You picked a good <laughs> place to live, John. You picked a good place to live. I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I did. <laughs> how about um, how about Montana, John? Like uh, we're actually heading down to Montana in November um, to go fishing. But um, you've spent some time in Montana as well, fishing there. Yeah, I have. Uh, not so much recently, although I was up there in um, April and I fished the Bitterroot mm. and um, God, what's that river on the? Oh, I fished the Flathead yeah. on the on the Flathead Reservation, which is an odd odd river because it doesn't have a lot of trout, but they're huge. Right. Right. I mean, you, you you can you can float. We floated twenty miles of it. Holy! And we didn't catch many fish, but I don't think we caught anything under nineteen or twenty inches. Oh, really? Nineteen or twenty and that, inches? That's yeah, nice. and that was in April, and it was cold and we were just fishing streamers there was no hatches or anything so we were just banging the banks with streamers and stripping them out (laughs) but yeah that was great that's crazy long flow too yeah yeah we're we're going to livingston in really early november so we might get crazy weather as well you know you never know not really sure what to expect but uh but yeah (laughs) I fished, uh, got to fish in around Annis, but never, uh, and, and fished the Madison, but, uh, and got through Bozeman, but it'll be cool to see Livingston. I've seen photos, watched videos, and it seems like a very picturesque town, and obviously fly fishing is strong. If, the force is strong yeah. in Livingston. <laughs> if you're going to, if you're going to go to Livingston, you should try, um, Nelson Spring Creek. Okay. All right. It's good info. That's a that's you know it's a private spring creek you have to pay to get on and all that but it's um I don't know it's exceptional it's real hard yeah we've never and, uh, fished a I've never fished a spring creek we've never got the opportunity to fish a spring creek um, yet yeah yet yet yeah. Yeah. but in November uh, I think I think you should be able to get on it and uh, yeah, you'll you'll enjoy it. It can it can skunky though. It can it can be better than you are. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. 
We're, I've never, we're accustomed to that. I've, yeah, I've never <laughs> been skunked there, but I, you know, there's been a couple of times where it was all I could do to pull it out. Right. They just, they just look at everything I threw at them and turn tail and swim away, you know. Yeah. How about float planes? So we just did a trip in July where we went mm-hmm. to northern Ontario and we took our first float plane trip and it blew our minds. Those things are great, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was so fun. And it was the first time we've ever been on a float plane. All and four it, of us, yeah. We just couldn't believe that we were taking a plane to go fishing for a pike as big as us. But what yeah, about float you know, planes? Do you, you know what kind of plane it was? Yeah. It was a turbo, turbo beaver. beaver, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They actually got it out of a museum and refurbished it, <laughs> is, is what it seemed like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Some of those things were made back in, uh, I think, the, as early as the 50s. Yeah. And they're, they're still in use. All those, they're, they've been... Some of those planes have been refurbished so many times, I don't know how much original equipment there is on them. Yeah, yeah. You know, you constantly change out the motors, those big Pratt & Whitney radial engines and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they're, it's, it's a wonderful way to get around. Um, I've flown in quite a few beavers, a couple of otters. I flew in a twin otter once. That's a wonderful, oh, cool. big yeah. old plane. Um you know, carries a big payload and a lot of people. And yeah. A lot of the, um, a lot of the lodges will hire a twin otter to fly people into the lodge. Yeah. Because they can, they, you know, they, they, you can do the whole thing. You can do a week's worth of supplies and, and ten or twelve sports in one trip. Yeah. But uh, I, my, the main thing I learned about float planes is to wear earplugs because uh, I was just going to say yeah, it's loud. Yeah. They're terribly loud and. Some of the guides, I've met guides who are all but deaf from riding around in float planes all the time. Yeah. I don't think anybody adequately prepared any of us for, like, how wild or <laughs> insane the that the journey, like, like just actually being in a float plane was, you know, yeah. it being so loud. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, I guess you don't think about it. I've taken a lot of flights in my life, but I've never flown that close to the ground in that kind of perspective. And it was, yeah, it was... You know, I left the plane feeling pretty lightheaded. You know, I think <laughs> Gap, yeah, we, uh, Gap felt a little bit sick. Yeah, I was, I, like, was uh, I was like, a float plane is insane. I was pretty disappointed, not disappointed, but in myself, because I've wanted to be on a float plane since I was like probably like seven years old. And then I was sick the whole time. <laughs> so I felt pretty bad. <laughs> I was like, I still love it. <laughs> yeah, I, luckily I don't get sick on on planes, I'm I'm good that way. But um, I can see how it would happen. Yeah. Um, Whereabouts did you take those trips to in those float planes? Oh, let's see. I've been in a number of them in Alaska, uh, Northwest Territories. Uh, I was up in Nunavut not too many years ago. Ooh. Flew from um, uh, flew up to the Tree River to fish for those sea run Arctic char. Oh. Oh. <laughs> we, uh, we have a friend. We have a friend at uh, Drift Outfitter, the fly shop downtown Toronto, that guides there in the summer. Yeah. So we hear all about it. He was our and guest. See uh, so many photos. <laughs> Tree River looks amazing. Was it amazing? It was amazing, and um, you know there isn't a tree within a hundred miles. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I have no idea why they called it the Tree River. In fact, I asked one of the <laughs> asked one of the guides, and he, he said he thought it was English explorers looking for uh-huh. firewood, and named it ironically. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, because you get you you know you'd be in these little canvas like Quonset hut things, and the only heat is an oil heater, mm-hmm. uh, which you know better than nothing, but they don't work great. I like a roaring wood fire myself. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I've been in a, a lot of them in uh, Labrador. I go to Labrador quite a bit, and um, so I'm I'm in those quite a bit up there. Just I was just up there in August. Oh, nice. Oh, well, where about and, in Labrador? Uh, uh, it was on the the Woods River system. It's a lodge called Three Rivers Lodge. Oh yeah, run by oh. Robin Reeves, and. Um, Oh, just a wonderful place. I, in fact, Robin and I were trying to figure out if this was my ninth or tenth time there. Oh, oh really? Wow. wow, that's awesome. Couldn't couldn't quite figure it out. Just great big brook trout. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, and and they have a wonderful pilot there named Gilles Moran. Um, and he's just he's just one of those magicians with a with a float plane. I mean, set that thing down in places you wouldn't think it was possible. Yeah. Our our pilot this summer it was in Ontario, uh, not in Quebec, but uh, it was also a French Canadian, just like north of where I grew up actually. And he was a quiet cavalier. We had a good time. It was like, you guys have camera, okay, buckle yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. so, did some twirl. <laughs> He's so crazy. He makes yeah, well, you know, Gilles is. Um, you could you could think he was a little crazy, but the fact is he's not. I mean, he just knows what the plane will do, mm -hmm. right. and he really knows what he's doing. But I mean, he's pretty much all business. Um, it's a it's a delicate balance, and I mean, if if you if you're a real greenhorn and and you think he's crazy, he'll act crazy to <laughs> to amuse you. But he's not. I mean, none of those guys are. Uh, they don't want to die any more than we do, and yeah. um, so they're you know they're as careful as they can be. It's a dangerous business, but they're pretty careful. Yeah. Yeah. From from the outside, when you're not used to a float plane, pretty much all those those pilot kind of look crazy. But but you're right. Like they they know very well what they're doing, and yeah. they're very experienced, and they want to go back yeah. home and have coffee. You know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And then I saw some pictures online too recently of you with uh, some pretty monster musky. Oh yeah, that's up on um, the Flambeau River in Wisconsin. Right on. When did you get into musky fishing, or has it been like a long uh, affair? It it hasn't been long. Um, I've been doing it about four years. Yeah. Um, my artist friend Bob White, who has been, he's been illustrating my column for over 25 years now and um he's a great guy he's a you know you should in fact you should interview him he's a really interesting guy yeah we'd love to sporting artist he's been doing it as long as i've been writing about it and um he's really good um anyway he started putting together a musky trip mm -hmm. every fall and um I just, uh, I thought, well, what the hell? You know, the guy's a friend, and um, it sounds, I, you know, I thought it was stunt fishing. and But I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go up and try that. It sounds like it might be interesting, and I just got hooked. I mean, it's just fascinating, and the fish are, the fish are huge, and um, uh, they're really hard to catch. Uh, they make steelhead look easy. <laughs> Uh, the real moody fish. I mean, if the fish wants your fly, you can't get it away from it. Yeah. But they're just moody. I mean, they'll just they'll ignore a fly and they'll or they'll just follow it, but they won't eat it. And, and uh, you know, and you, you you always go back to the size. They're, I mean, it can be fifty inches long. Yeah. Really yeah. Huge. And they've got these mouths full of wolf-like teeth, and yeah. so you know. You fish for you fish for them with foot long flies and and twelve weight rods and wire leaders and you know it's real uh, it's real hand to hand combat stuff. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And do you remember your first your first muskie? Like, what was that experience like? Because like what I've heard is it's just like it's a ton of casts. You don't really you know you got to find the fish. And when you do, like you said, they're temperamental. But when you get your first muskie, it's sort of like a game changer. Yeah, well, my first muskie was about a yard long. It went, and you know, nice fish, but not not a not a particularly great muskie. Yeah. And the the whole thing is learning how to set the hook because their mouths are real hard, yeah. and their jaws are so strong that you can they will grab a fly, and you set the hook, but the 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 fly doesn't move. Oh wow! Right, because they hold it so tight. So you you can think you've got them. Yeah. And when they get tired of this thing pulling back on them, they'll just open their mouths and let go. Yeah. And they weren't hooked. So you have to. Uh, in fact, one of the one of the musky guys I know said, "You have to strip set them real hard. You don't use the rod at all. Point the rod right at them. 
strip set with your left hand two or three times, just as hard as you can, yeah. and then you put them on the rod. Yeah. And you and you don't give an inch. You play them right from however much line you've got out. You play them from there to the boat. You never let them run. Yeah. And I've gotten rope burns from, <laughs> from not letting them run. Oh, man. Um, but it's he. It, the way he put it was, he said, first you try to break the line, and then you try to break the rod. Yeah. He said, if you break a rod on one of these fish, I'll be proud of you. Yeah. Because it means you, it means you were pulling hard enough. Yeah. So that's that's the thing. Because I mean, I'm a I'm a long time trout guy, yeah. and my my uh, my muscle memory makes me want to raise the rod tip just enough to sink a size sixteen light wire hook. Right. Yeah. So it's it's really hard for me to just honk <laughs> yeah. on one of these big fish. Yeah. But I've I've learned to do it. Yeah, yeah. And then I and then I come back. It's always in September. It's always the last uh, the last full moon in September. And uh, then I come back, and what's going on at home is size twenty blue winged olives on six yeah. x tippet so the first couple of fish i just honk on <laughs> yeah <laughs> fly out of the water, uh, out of the water yeah. i well i yeah i snap them off yeah. yeah yeah and then i have to sort of stop and say okay right. you're trout fishing now. switch yeah. gears it's all switch different gears. yeah yeah i think we we, we, we experienced the same thing yeah we yeah. had um we had a week-long pike trip up in northern ontario and 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 going through the motions of trying to stop trout setting and then our very next fishing trip, when we got back home, we went to go fish the like uh, the trico hatch, the trico trico hatch. hatch. for the small brook yeah, trout. Yeah. For small yeah. tr- brook trout, and it just... could have been more opposite. <laughs> it, yeah, it was a polar opposite. We're just snapping, snapping tippet yeah. left, right, and center. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you tie your own uh, musky flies? I don't, and I don't own a musky rod yet either. Yeah. I just these guys. This is one of those trips where they supply everything. Right. Yeah. Which is real nice, um, but you do tie flies, yes. I do. T- I do tie most of my own flies. Yeah, I've seen. I've seen one of your patterns actually. A streamer pattern is really, really nice. <clears throat> oh, thank you. How do you? Uh, um, how does that process kind of unfold? Like figuring out, you know, a new streamer pattern. Well, I don't know. I there was a time when everybody was inventing new patterns, and so I. I tried to invent new patterns and streamers. I mean, you just, you kind of look at all the streamers that have ever been tied to get an idea of how streamers are tied. And then you just put things together that you think look good or you think look like a fish or you think are going to act seductive in the water or I don't know, but I, I sort of gave up on, trying to invent new patterns. What I do now is I just take established patterns and try to learn how to tie them well and tie them quickly so I can think of them as being expendable. Yeah. Like, like a shotgun shell. Like you just, if you know, if you stick it in a bush because you were trying to reach a (laughs) fish, it was hard to reach fine. You know, there's, you got more in the box because, because you tied a bunch. Um, and I've I've changed a pattern or two in various ways, either to make it easier to tie or just because I think it looks better or whatever. But I've I'm not a, a great fly innovator. I I mostly just try to tie simple flies that will work um, and tie them so they're durable and so they don't take too long to tie. Yeah, so I don't have to worry about them. I, I do. I do tie some steelhead flies, and it's it's possible to get a little a little fancy and traditional with steelhead flies. Yep. Yep. Um, I don't. You don't lose them as as often. Yeah. So um, you know you can kind of get away with it, but I, I tie some sort of fancy spay style steelhead flies just because they're so pretty. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hard to resist. Yeah. So are you getting ready to take the double-handed rod out then? Are you swinging for steelhead? I am. I don't think I'm going to go this year because the 
the returns uh, on the West Coast have been pretty bad. Oh, yeah, yeah. pretty brutal. Yeah, we've been hearing that fact, a lot. Yeah, last two years have been really, really poor returns. And um, I, I feel sorry for the guys who make their living guiding steelhead fishermen because people are just canceling trips. Jeez. But, um, you know, if a trout needs a healthy stream, a steelhead needs a healthy hemisphere. Yeah. Right? right? I mean, it. you know, it's born in the Columbia River drainage. It lives there for a couple of years. It swims to Japan and gets big eaten squid and stuff and then it swims back and god there's you know there's all kinds of predators in between and there's uh commercial fishermen they get they get caught for bycatch and yeah. thrown back dead and um it's it's a hard life on steelhead yeah it really is yeah yeah it's an incredible fish we're going to be fishing great lake steelhead a little different but it's some of our favorite, you know, it's it's my favorite time of year. I can't wait to get out and just swing the spay rod again. I've never done that. Um, the the West Coast guys don't think those are steelhead. I know. I don't I don't have an opinion, but yeah. as a as a guide friend of mine out in uh in Washington says, if it ain't got salt water in its veins, it ain't a steelhead. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's just how they feel. But um I don't know. I've seen pictures of Great Lakes steelhead. They look like steelhead to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's something. And, there's something. And I, I understand there are places where you can swing for them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Effectively. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah there is. And, and, I mean, there is a, there. I guess there is a difference, right? Great Lakes steelhead. I think that's why we classify them Great Lakes because, yeah, you know, it, it is a different fish, but it's 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 a unique fish, right? It's It's not the same as a West Coast steelhead. Absolutely. Well, yeah, they're ad fluvial instead of an, uh, anadromous, right? I yeah. mean, they don't go to the sea, but they use the Great Lakes like an ocean. Yeah. And then come back to the rivers. And so the only difference is that there's no salt water involved. Yeah. Um, but, I need to try it, if only because the I'm afraid the West Coast uh, steelhead fisheries yeah. are starting to wear out. Yeah, it's sad to see that happen. Oh, you're always welcome to come with us. Yeah, we won't say we won't tell yeah, anyone. I, we won't tell anyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll keep that in mind. That's that good. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna. Yeah, Aldo. Uh, I was just getting back to your writing, John. John, are you, are you working on anything now? Currently, are you still writing? Do you find that you're writing more or less than than you used to, or maybe the same? I'm I'm actually writing less than I used to because I'm taking longer to do it. Okay, and I'm not sure why that is, um, but I think it's just because I've gotten to be a a real perfectionist. I mean, I just don't I don't want to let it out until mm -hmm. I know it's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've I've just finished. Um, you guys know about the fly fishing film tour? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, the magazine Stonefly that goes with that tour, mm -hmm. um, that thing is run by a good friend of mine. So I just finished a story for him for this next issue. All right on. And I'm right. I, I wrote for the longest time for, um, um, fly rod and reel magazine. Yeah. And when they went out of business, Bob White, my illustrator and I went with trout magazine. Mm. So I'm, I'm still writing those. I have to write those pretty far ahead because Bob does a painting to illustrate each um, each column and so he needs to have that painting for a while before he or he needs to have the article for a while so he has time to do the painting plus he, you know he's guiding and doing other stuff too so um, do you ever find it hard so to I'm write? Working. do you ever find uh, you get stuck? Yeah, or? yeah periodically sure yeah. Does fishing help? Sure. <laughs> Does fishing I, help or hurt, <laughs> actually? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> actually, fishing almost always, uh, it almost always helps, and it never hurts. Yeah. Right? I mean, if I'm stuck on a story and go fishing for the afternoon, I could come back and still be stuck, but it didn't hurt anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and sometimes just being able to clear your mind... Um, 
I've had people say, oh, so you go up and fish and think about the story. No, I go up and fish and think about the fishing. Mm -hmm. And usually on the drive home, I'll go, oh, I know. I know what to do next. Yeah. I think, so it really helps, you know, either that or get a night's sleep. Yeah. 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 And yeah just come back to it fresh. I think uh, all of us here can, you know, we know better than most that, you know, you can't force creativity. You need that break. You need that separation. And then it'll just happen when it's ready to come out. Yeah. I, I, I like to think that, but at the same time, when you, Right for Deadlines. a living, <laughs> you 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 better be able to make it come out. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's true. You, you know, you just sometimes you start. I just always give myself as much time as I can. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing. And so, you the biggest part for me is figuring out okay, where do I, where does this story begin? Mm-hmm. Right, like a story is a a story is this huge barn with a thousand doors in it, and you got to go through the right door. Yeah. And if you, and so I, I'll write lead after lead after lead and go, no, it's not right. No, it's, yeah. that doesn't go anywhere. And then pretty soon I write the right lead and the lead takes me somewhere else. And I go, okay, that's it. Now I'm in. Hmm. And then it usually ends up getting written. It seems like your process but, is a bit of a choose your own adventure. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. It's just a matter of, I mean, it's always, it's always start safe to start at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Right. But, boy, sometimes it's that just doesn't work. Uh, the, the biggest problem you run into there is you end up doing, like, the narration for Uncle Bob's uh, vacation to Hawaii. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, here we are at the airport. Here we are getting on the plane. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes you just need to start someplace else and then come back to the beginning if you have to. But do you have a main, the main thing, the main thing beginning writers don't realize is that there's a lot you don't have to say. If you're talking about fishing in Labrador, you don't have to say how you got there. Yeah. (laughs) Unless it was, that was the whole adventure was getting there. And sometimes it is. Yeah. But, um, so there's, the, you got to learn, what was it? Yeah, Ernest Hemingway said, stories get better the more you can take out of them. Yeah. And I, I, I'm a firm believer in that. I mean, you just yeah. get to what matters. Yeah. And you'll have to, sometimes to get to what matters, you'll have to explain why something, how or why something happened, but do it quickly and get to what matters. Yeah. Yeah, it's design's a similar thing, you know, taking out elements until you're with the essentials. Exactly. Would you say that Hemingway's maybe, or who inspires you? Like when, back in the 60s when you're like, I want to be a writer, who are you, who are you reading at the time? Uh, I was reading Hemingway, mm-hmm. who I, I flash hot and cold on. Hmm. Some you know, I, sometimes I I really like his work. Sometimes I think he's just a little too kind of macho and um, yeah. But but I, the one thing I'll say about Hemingway is that before Hemingway, everybody wrote like a Victorian lawyer, <laughs> and after and after Hemingway, everybody wrote like a newspaper writer. Yeah, right, and. That was a huge difference. I mean, even people who say they don't like Hemingway, most of them wouldn't write the way they do without him. So you you you've got to go back and at least read the up in Michigan stories and some of that stuff every once in a while just to just to realize where where what we're all doing came from. Yeah. But uh, in the when I first got started writing about fishing, uh, I was deeply into Tom McGuane, uh, Russ Chatham, who's a painter, but also a good writer, uh, Jim Harrison, to a lesser degree, great writer, didn't really write that much about hunting and fishing, but he did write some. Um, and they're different people. I mean, McGuane has, uh, I know McGuane a little bit, spend a little time together and his control is amazing. I mean, 
every word is in place, everything is perfect. And so I've always admired him for that, his ability to be in complete control. But at the same time, I've always admired Jim Harrison for his apparent lack of control. He's just all over the place. Hmm. But he somehow makes it work. Hmm. And I've yet to figure out how he does that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I and I also like Alice Munro, who's a Canadian writer. Oh, yeah, I love yes, Alice. yeah. I, you know, and she's another one where I just can't figure out how she does it. And I, I think I've read everything she's published at least once, a couple of them two or three times, and I just, I don't know how she manages to do it. Yeah. I think a lot of it's just her attitude. And some people think she's too little old lady-ish, but man... You read that stuff. There's some pretty raw stuff. <laughs> There's some pretty really raw Alice stuff. Alice in her work, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and she, you know, she sometimes dances or you know, tap dances around a little bit. But if you, you stop and think about what's going on. Mm-hmm. She's killing people, and that, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. What do you find inspires you um, in your writing? Like, how do you like when you're driving back from a day of fishing in the car, and you know something comes into your mind? Like, what is it that sort of sparks that that fire for the next story or or novel you know it's just all about the writing i i just try to craft good quality stories Mm -hmm. and um so i i use the, the the fishing as raw material to craft the best stories i can do um you know John. You know who John McPhee is. He's a he's a nonfiction, long form nonfiction writer. He's been around forever. Wrote a lot for the New Yorker. He used to. I think he worked. Well, I know he works on a computer now. But what he used to do was he would research a story, and he was one of those deep researchers. Like he he'd spend a year in Alaska and come back and write a story about it. Whoa. Don't know how he ever afforded to do that. But, <laughs> yeah. um, and what he would do is he'd go through his notes, and he would write every element of the story on a three by five card. And then he would just start going through these three by five cards, and he'd have thousands of them. And he'd go through and he'd go, "Well, this, this I don't need. That's inconsequential." And this, this I need, and so he'd go through them that way, and then he'd start putting them in order, and then he'd put them up on a big, a big uh, cork board, stick them on a cork board, yeah. and shuffle them around and get them all in the right order, and then he'd just put them together like a deck of cards and go through and write the story. Yeah. So, so he said. Yeah. Uh, I'm always, I'm always a little suspicious about writers who describe how they write because right. I think. I think they're describing the rare great days. Yeah. Yeah. But he's also admitted to, he said he laid, laid on his back on a picnic table and stared at the sky for a month before he started one story. <laughs> yeah. Wife thought he was, she was going to have to take him to the hospital. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's, that's kind of what I do. I just, I just start, um, well, I was up in Labrador. We were out looking for lake trout one day, pouring rain, horrible weather. And nobody could find lake trout except this one kid, and it was his first year guiding at the lodge, first year guiding anywhere. And he took a couple of guys up to this place where nobody ever goes. This is, had to go through a little pass on the lake and up into this little arm. And he found a, a about a two-acre pothole with a with a creek running into it. And he caught 25 lake trout, two guys, 25 lake trout in about an hour. That's pretty amazing. And (laughs) his name was, uh, I want to say it was Darcy. It's in my notes. Yeah. But I won't look right now. Um, And one of the older guides said, that's going to, he said, that'll end up being known as Darcy's Cove. And I thought, there's the story. That's my yeah. story. Yeah. I just need to I just need to get to that. But that's going to be the title of the story. Mm-hmm. And and that's where it's going to go yeah. because 
And, of course, all the older guys were giving him shit about it, but secretly kind of patting him on the back. They give him shit for five minutes, and then they punch him in the shoulder and say, good job, kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and he was beaming, you know. He was he was blushing like a bride because he's real happy about it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff. It, I mean, it isn't, it isn't that they caught 25 lake trout. It's that this kid figured something out that nobody else figured out. And everybody kind of grudgingly gave him his due. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff I like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's real stuff. It's the, you know, honest sort of stories yeah. about, you know, why people fish. Yeah. Well, and it's consequential stuff. I mean, that's going to mean more to that kid. If they end up calling that Darcy's Cove, yeah. if that goes on a map, yeah. I mean, that kid's going to be telling people in a bar somewhere that there's a cove na named after him <laughs> up in Labrador. Yeah. That's going to mean a lot to him. It's a big deal. Yeah. It's a bit of a David and Goliath story. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Kind of. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So we uh, we did this segment on the show. It's got the stupidest name ever. It's called Mitchie's Fishies Vive. My name's Mitchie, and we rhymed it. And it's just a terrible title for a segment. But basically what it is <laughs> is it's five questions, and uh, there's it's just five interesting sort of more pulled back broad questions about your fishing um you know, take and your, your fishing perspective. So, mm -hmm. so we got five questions here. So we'll go with, uh, we'll go with the first one here. It's almost like a buzzer beater kind of. Yeah. Kinda but, thing. Yeah. but you could take your time answering <laughs> it. There's, re there's really no rules. It's basically just it. the show. We've just <laughs> yeah. made a segment out of the, yeah. the last five questions. <laughs> so the yeah, first, okay, uh, fine. okay, cool. So the first, the first question here is call is, uh, is, is what is your favorite fish and why? My favorite fish, your favorite fish. Um, I I think my favorite fish is brook trout, Yay. and I think it's I and I think it's just because they're so gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, and they're so tough and rugged. Um, you know, there's back in the eighteen hundreds, late eighteen hundreds, um, we had we had virtually fished out most of the water in Colorado by the late eighteen hundreds because people were commercial fishing it. Yeah. And, you know, bringing wagon loads of fish out and selling them in town. So they started stocking, and they brought brook trout in from the east. And people just sort of indiscriminately put them here and there. And some of those populations are still there. Yeah. They're still up there. And you can I can go up tomorrow and catch some. And... um and they're, they're they're just a wonderful fish. They're the best eating of the trout, I think. And um, and then I got into Labrador, where you know they get five, six, seven pounds. <laughs> that's crazy. And um, and that's a whole different that's a whole different deal too. So I, it's probably it's probably brook trout, but at the same time, it's whatever I'm fishing for at the moment. Yep. I mean, if you'd ask me. Two weeks ago, I'd have said, "Well, it's musky. <laughs> why? Why wouldn't it be musky? Right? Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. They're they're four feet long. I know. I'm getting musky blow my mind. And giant pike. It's just like a new thing. I just yeah. Yeah. I got to catch a musky. I know exactly what you mean. But brook trout's a great answer. We all love brook trout. I mean, we fish for them all the time. Yeah. Gabs grew up fishing brook trout. Don't you think? Yeah, uh, also, don't you think that um, they kind of always live in pretty places? <laughs> Yeah, I think they do because they they want clean water. Yeah, yeah. And and at least out here, yeah, they they tend to live in pretty places. Pretty they tend to live pretty high up in the mountains. Yeah, that's so cool. Okay, so Mitchie's fishy number two. If you could fish anywhere in the world right now, where would you go and why? I think I'd go to. Um, I think I'd go to Iceland to fish for uh, sea trout. Ooh. Just because that's that's a trip I've always wanted to take, and I have yet to quite make it work. Um, I've talked to some people. I'm working on it. Yeah, yeah, that's. Sounds... But I I think that's uh, that's probably it because just because it's something I I want to do and I haven't been able to do it yet for one reason or another. Yeah, Iceland. Oh my God, that'd be amazing. So for the third question here. And this one, you feel free to, to 
take your time on this because you've got so many years of amazing fishing experiences. But what what's your favorite sort of just fishing or best fishing memory? What's a time that you just can think back on and just really appreciate? Well, there's a few of them, but um, I will pick I will pick uh, the first time I went to Labrador with my old friend A.K. Best. Yeah. And Jim Babb, who at the time was the editor of Gray Sporting Journal. And we had a great day at a place called Fifth Rapids. And um, caught a lot of fish, you know, like four to six pound brook trout on dry flies. Jeez. And we went back. They've got a, they built a little um, camp there, a little, a little uh, cabin for flyouts. And you go out, you know, fish the day, spend the night, fish the next morning and fly back. And um, there's a little creek, not so little, but there's a smaller creek that comes in on the other side of the cabin that they call Little Fifth. And after dinner, Jim just wanted to hang out. And um, AK and I said, we're going to go over to Little Fifth and see what's going on over there. And one of the guides came with us. And there was a, a mayfly hatch. I don't know what it was. It was about a size 10 or 12 big mayfly. And there were brook trout rising. And I hooked a big one, landed it. It was nine pounds. Jesus. And I just I just reeled up and sat down. <laughs> yeah. and, and, the, and the guide said, well, they're still rising, eh? And I said, yeah, I'm, that was a nine-pound brook trout. I said, I'm done. Yeah, you got to soak said, it in a bit. Said, a, 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 yeah, I said, AK, go catch a fish. Yeah. And so he caught, I don't know, he caught a couple of smaller, by smaller, I mean, you know, four or five pound <laughs> fish, and he caught Jeez. one that was nine pounds. Oh, my God. And it wasn't the same fish. Wow. And so we just said, that's it. We're done. We're going to go back to the cabin. And, and the guide couldn't get it. Yeah. He said, well, it's still rising. And we said, yeah. We're good. <laughs> that's it. <Yeah. laughs> We're yeah. done. <laughs> How that's, can you beat that? And that's that's, fine. that's what you went. That's what you went <laughs> yeah. there for, right? Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll have a yeah. smoke and then think about it. You got you got the fish. <laughs> Go back tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this next question, although it sounds silly, I guess to us and and people who would fly fish, because I don't know, there's a lot of obvious there's a lot of obvious answers to this one, but I guess it means um, something else to to everybody. But why do you fly fish? Why fly fish at all? Well, that's such a huge question. I know. <laughs> but, I, you know, I think it's just because it's it's pretty. Yeah. I mean, when it's, and God knows, if you went out with me, you would, you would not, you would see that not every cast I make is pretty. But, <laughs> you know, when it, when it goes well, when it goes the way you expect it to go or hope it's going to go, it's just beautiful. And, um... I think that's what I like about it. I think it's just a gorgeous thing to do. Yeah. No, I, it's, it's that's true. probably too simple an answer. No, 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 that's perfect. No, it's very it's true. It's just purely, it's just purely aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. So for this last and fifth of Mitchie's Fishies five, what fly pattern represents you best and why? <laughs> um, probably, the hair's your parachute dry fly. Ooh, you know what I'm lying? Good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why is that? Why does it Why does it represent you? Because, because it's... I, I, because it's plain, and it's workmanlike, and it's easy to tie, and it's effective. I mean, I've caught fish... It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's my favorite dry fly, so I fish it everywhere, so I catch a lot of fish on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, so naturally, it's a great fly, right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think just because it's 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 just a plain, traditional, workmanlike fly, and so you don't think about the fly. You don't think, well, okay, what's, you know, how do we put, tab A into slot B. It's it's you think about the cast and the drift and the presentation and, and all that. Um, 
don't think about the fly. It's 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 almost one of those flies for guys who are presentationists and don't worry about the fly. Yeah. They wor- they worry about how it's fished. Yeah. That was a really nice answer. Usually we get like a woolly bugger or something more <laughs> generic. <laughs> Yeah. John, thanks. That's so much. Mitchie's Fishies Five. That's 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 all the five I've got for you. Thank you so much for coming on the show, eh? We really like this was a big one for us. We were so stoked when you said you were down to do it. We were like, oh my god, yes, because we love your books. We've been following your writing. Um, we're huge fans. So thank you so much. Well, hey, I appreciate so much. that. Yeah, thanks so much, John. It was uh, it was awesome, and it it was exciting. It was really exciting. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Bye. Okay, that was our uh, that was our interview with John Gierak. It was a huge one for us. We obviously were uh, so excited to have him on the show. He's a legend. He's an amazing writer. Uh, it was it was insane. It was so cool to get to talk to him for for an hour and a half. And we're glad that uh, we got to share with you. Hopefully, you liked it. Uh, that's it for me. That's it for the show from SoFly. It's it for me, Mitch, Gab. Hey, you're right on, people. Uh, Yilma. All right. See you guys next time. And Aldo. Yeah, I mean that was pretty cool. Um, if uh, you need to find us, we're at. The SoFly crew on Instagram. Uh, you can find us at SoFly.ca. All our videos, photos, and uh, podcasts, as well as you can uh, reach out to us at the SoFly crew at gmail.com with any comments, questions, concerns. We're actually starting to get a lot of feedback or more feedback than we have been in the past. And it's awesome hearing from you guys. So, um, yeah, that's it for me. Although, a big thanks to John again. And uh, see you next time. Yeah, thanks everybody for listening. Peace. <laughs>